Hello. Thank you yes. for joining us. Hello. Uh, Hello. In 2009 and once again in 2017, the Irish Repertory Theatre produced Eugene O'Neill's play, The Emperor Jones. The story is of Brutus Jones, a black man, once a Pullman porter on the trains. He got in trouble with the law and escaped to a Caribbean island where he proclaimed himself emperor. There was an uprising among the peoples and once again Brutus had to make his escape and as the dense forest swallows him up he goes deeper into his psyche where he visits his ancestral beginnings and relives the sins that were perpetrated upon his race. So in 2009 and again in 2017 I had the great privilege of directing two distinctive and distinguished actors in the role of Brutus Jones. John Douglas Thompson and Obi Abili. John Douglas Thompson has been described by the New York Times as one of America's greatest classical actors. He's enjoyed a career on Broadway, off-Broadway, regional theater, major motion picture, television, radio. But I imagine though that his true love is to be on the stage doing great classical roles. Mm -hmm. Obi Abili, who followed in John's footsteps in the revival, comes from London, where he was an overnight sensation in John Guare's Six Degrees of Separation. He came to America uh, to BAM in Ivo Van Hove's production of Antigone with uh, Juliette Binoche, and has had a terrific career in film and television. There are those who have described the Emperor Jones as a, as a dated play, a racist play. What was your initial instinct when you read that play for the first time, John? I had always loved O'Neill and wanted someday to be in Long Day's Journey and Tonight or Iceman Cometh. Those were the plays I were familiar with. And when you talked to me about Emperor Jones, I didn't really know much about it. And everybody I asked, including my agents at the time, said, do not do that play. So there was always this kind of undercurrent that there's some inherent problems with the play as it relates to race. So when I read the play, I almost said, okay, maybe everybody's right. Maybe this is something maybe I shouldn't do. I did find some really redeeming qualities in that the character was a fascinating study in this kind of uh, way of stripping oneself to its bare essence. Um, in an effort to gain some sort of self-knowledge or awakening. I started to at least study O'Neill and what he had done with his plays and other Black characters in his plays. So what I found out was that Brutus Jones was the first major stage role for a Black actor, the first major protagonist in American theater, period. I also realized that he had had three other black characters, Joe Mott in Iceman Cometh, Jim Harris in All God's Chillin Got Wings, and I guess it's Abe in The Dreamy Kid. So O'Neill had spent some time writing black characters well before any other writer, certainly of his time, had written any and gave them fairly significant roles in his plays. I got the sense that he knew something or was sympathetic to the black struggle. He must have been to write those characters. And then under more deeper research, what I realized was he had a black friend by the name of Joe Smith, who was really integral in O'Neill's life. So you, I started to realize there was this kind of legacy of O'Neill really wanting to be of service to the African-American and the African-American's plight and he put them in his plays when no one else would and argued for them. So I had to look at Emperor Jones differently than maybe other critics had or other people had thought. I started to look at it as certainly a play about America through the prism of a black man, but it's very much a play about uh, exploitation and colonialism. And it has more to say about whiteness than blackness in the sense that everything that Brutus Jones does is truly American. Exploiting and colonialism, American. His idea of, of, of setting up a, a kingship in another land and exploiting those individuals, that's American. The idea to be a capitalist, which is what he strives to do, that is American. 
What was fascinating about the play is he told this American story through a black man's eyes or black man's prism. And as the play moves forward, it actually moves backwards for Emperor Jones, right? Because he then begins to revisit his own unconscious understanding of the plight of his people. It wasn't a play so much about race as O'Neill trying to, to reach out and to say something about this great experiment of democracy in our country that for some people it's not working. And for the black man, the struggle was such that they had to be under the boot of white racism and this is what it created. So I just thought the character was quite diverse, quite um, intelligent, quite dynamic, and said a lot about America at the time. Obi, when you read The Emperor Jones for the first time, but I'm wondering, is there a different visceral reaction from an African-American man to read this play than from, say, somebody from, from, from a black man from London to read yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My first um, contact with the play was when Patterson Joseph did it at the gate, a small um, chamber theater in, in England. I heard about this uh, play that was a long monologue that involved a descent into madness. And then I saw Eugene O'Neill's name <laughs> underneath the title. And I was like, Eugene O'Neill's right for black people, what? I didn't. <laughs> and so <laughs> I did a little bit of research. But the initial sort of rumblings were that, for me, were that the play is simply a play that is, is, is a play for, uh, for white people to watch a black person destroy themselves on stage. But the more I started to know about Eugene O'Neill and his writing and, and his history, like the, the idea of this broken man who from the depths of his soul would pull out these, I, I would call them acts of healing. That's what I look at his plays as, attempts to sort of self-heal, to fix. I started to think to myself, well, maybe, the, maybe there's something in, in what he's trying to do with this play, because I still refuse to read it. <laughs> this is the first thing that landed on my desk from my agent. I'd arrived on my new, my new visa and everything. I was ready to go, you know, ready to attack New York. I got this play, I, I could not, I couldn't believe it. I thought, oh no, they, they want me to do, they want me to do the dance. They want me to pay penance for entry. I have to do the rest. <laughs> <laughs> I spoke to a couple of my friends and people and I was like, and I, you know, went through, I was like, there is no way I'm not doing this. This is, this is, this is horrible. It's terrible. You know, Trump had just got in as well. And then what did it, because, you know, Kieran's a silver fox is, um, I went and met up with Kieran, if you remember, we had that lunch. He spoke so openly and so warmly. But what was key for me was that he was, he was very um, open for the discussion of race. And as we know now, this is such a complex, such a emotional, such a, a, a difficult discussion to have, you know. But yet, and, and what normally happens with a white person is that they avoid it. They don't want to, you know, they deny it. They don't want to engage. And so, as we know, we, we, we get into this loop of, constant hurt and pain. But here was this man who was speaking very openly about this play and speaking openly about whiteness and blackness and wanted to, was so um, eager to get into a dialogue. And that for me was something that was, um, that was so key because so often again, you, you get into these conversations with black white directors that want to do the race play. And unfortunately what this perpetuated is what I originally feared of O'Neill's work, that it was it's just to destroy the black body or the black psyche in some way to, to oppress or to um, perpetuate the same racisms, even if they're white liberal make well-meaning ones. I've seen it so often. To do this play and to, to think about doing the play, I think from a theatrical perspective, someone like yourself, uh, Kieran, that wants to direct it, if we can look at the play and look at what it says about America, but it's just really using a black man's gaze to look through, at least a black man's the prism of a black man, what you end up finding is there's a lot of universal themes about the play. Yeah. But at the end of the day, we all become primal. At the end of the day, through our fur fury, rage, and anger that life puts on us, we all go to this place. And that's a universal theme. The idea of Brutus Jones just having the ambition to be more than what society is forcing him to be, because it's the society's subjugation of him because of his race, that he has an ambition to be more than that. And he ends up being an emperor, being a capitalist, and all these things are very, very American. So it has a lot to do with the relationship with whiteness and blackness and what they do to each other. So this institution of slavery created this yeah. incredibly tenuous relationship that we still see today 
you know, here we are in 2020 in a point of because of the pandemic, because of the murders and the killings of black and brown bodies, here we are today, once again, re-examining that relationship, which is about white supremacy and the racism that, that exists within it that has made the African-American a second-class citizen. Yeah. The idea of systemic racism that grows out of this institution of slavery that then poisons the rest of our lives, not just blacks, but whites as well. And here we are having to come back and sit at the table and talk about these things, which are really uncomfortable, really difficult, and it's going to be that way and as well as it should be that way. Yeah. But for me, when I look at the play, I can't say that it answers anything today or really speaks to today other than understanding the long arm of history in that the state of affairs with Blacks in this country, even in 1920, when O'Neill released the play, still stand. It still stands. You know, given where we are today, and the conversation that's going on today. What is the role of theater? What should we be doing? As artists, I think that we all, whether you are Albanian, you're black, you're whatever, we would have experienced some form of these kind of fractures within our communities against other communities. And our job as actors and artists, as painters, writers, whatever, for me is always to respond to trauma in the way that we do, which is to create. Because these things are destructive, right? So I think that the job of any kind of artist is to create, to be the antithesis of destruction. So in a way, it's kind of... <laughs> Another yes. Another yes. Did you pay that person to honk at this time? <laughs> so yeah, so I think the job of any artist is to literally to create in order to, to apply healing, to apply the antithesis to destruction. I think your job as an actor in any community is to... I think in our DNA, all of us from Sophocles, even way back to now in the future, I think that's part of our DNA as storytellers that we are bearing witness, but more importantly, we're creating in order to, to try and fix something or to try and uh, soothe or to offer some kind of healing. But more specifically, when it comes to this idea of what actors are doing with a specific issue of racism, and obviously we're looking at more specifically at the history of slavery in this country, and all the cyclical effects and all the terrible fractures in this house that is now corrupted beyond repair for me and needs to be knocked down, is that any artist coming within that house will understand why this architecture of this place is messed up because the universal truths of corruption, they're, they're, they're universal, they're everywhere. You know, we, we, as a black man, I understand race very, very deeply <laughs> just as well as in the African American, as white people are, it's our time to you know to shut up and listen. So so <laughs> you know, so it's we want to like want to hear what it is. John, you've served on the board of several mm -hmm. theater companies. You think deeply about these things. What should we be doing these days? Well, I I certainly think we should be having these discussions and looking at them being difficult and uncomfortable. And I think we have to start owning up to our portion, mm. our share, mm. that creates this systemic racism to continue and build. And so it affects all industries, all walks of life. I said to somebody, you know, racist, systemic racism surrounds me in 360, you know what I mean? It's, it's yeah. so prolific. So I think as institutions, we need to look at how we we allow this system to build and strengthen and look at ways of dismantling it. So, mm -hmm. I mean, some of the specific ways is obviously white people having these conversations because sometimes you can, you can think that you may not have anything to do with this. Like this is happening over there. This is yeah. it's nothing that I'm doing that's creating this mm -hmm. situation. It's happening over there, but no, you're actually living in a living, breathing part of the situation because you're not doing anything to stop it because you see the unfairness, you see how unequal it is, right? It's like, we just wanna have what's in the constitution that all men are created equal. And then we exist and we walk around and see the unfairness and some of it's quite insidious. So we need to look 
and our own individual lives. And then as institutions look and say, okay, well, what can we do to add a broader voice, broader equality? Let's enhance our board. Let's get more black and brown people on the board. Let's also within our executive management, I'm talking theater specifically, because that's what I do. Right. Within our executive management, let us look and bring in a more diverse picture of our for our executive management. Because at the end of the day, we're just really strong together than separately. Yeah. So to add all those voices only strengthens us as a community and strengthens our institutions. So, and I think those discussions need to be happening across the board. I'm saying what happens in theater, most theaters that I've worked at predominantly will have an all white board of directors. And the board of directors is basically shaping the decisions, the ideas, the future, the path of the institution. So that could use some changing. I think we all understand that. It's, We've looked at this problem for years, for decades. We just haven't decided to do anything about it. So it's not as if this is a new issue, like, oh my God, this is a new problem. I didn't really realize it until yesterday. No, we've been living in this uncomfortable stew for a long time. So there are specific things that people can do, but I also think, like even yourself, uh, Kieran, as, as a white male in this society running the Irish rep, then yeah, you have to look and say, okay, how can I open the doors of our theater and our opportunities to do this kind of work to a broader uh, population, even though you're an Irish American theater. Like, yeah. where are there some parallels that relate to, you know, uh, just as a crazy idea, you could do an August Wilson play and see those parallels between August Wilson and Eugene O'Neill. That would be a wonderful thing to do to do some August Wilson and do some O'Neill and look at those two great American playwrights to understand what they were both trying to do, uh, which is talk about alienation and being the other in this American society. They both write cycles of plays. I mean, that's those are things that I think institutions from a board and from executive management don't think about because they don't have any diversity that's there yeah. to bring those ideas to the to the table to the fore the artist wants to heal because there are so many broken things within our society personally yeah. and outside of us and our job and that's what i think audiences look for us to do is to bring about healing but it's not just the individual artists the institutions that promote art need to also do that. And I think one of the ways they can do it that they haven't done in the past is to open up more opportunities for diversity. Like now is the time. Uh, hopefully as an African-American artist, I don't want to be having this conversation 10 years from now. Yeah. I want to look back on this time and say, this was a watershed moment. People really opened their eyes, whites, blacks, and we decided to come together in historical ways that we hadn't done before. It made us uncomfortable. It yeah. made things really difficult, but this is what we produced out of it. And do more, be bigger, share opportunity, do not hoard it, look for diversity, look for ways where you see the indignities and the unfairness of racism and look ways to stop it, to dismantle it. Because if you don't, that means you're actually a part of it. If you let it go on, you actually allow it to survive. Can I just add to some things that John's saying? Because he said some really incredible things. Always such an eloquent speaker. And I think these uncomfortable conversations that bring us closer to fundamental truths of, of, of universal trauma, which is what this is, which is what racism is, are the, are the, 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 the thing that will tilt us into a place of atonement because I still think racism itself is still seen as this kind of confused, sort of complex thing that happens because you're a black person. No, it's a traumatic oppression of another human being, which we understand in all other histories and in all other communities. We understand that with the Jews in Nazi Germany, we understand, and, and, and so on and so on with the Armenians, with Turkey and so on, all, all the races, we understand that as, but still it's seen as a slippery thing that's not quite this terrible thing that it really is, but it's kind of sort of something else that we need to stamp out. No, it's a true mass trauma of people. And I still think that if institutions do play the performative act of diverse boards and all that, which I, we're seeing at the moment with a lot of the corporations that are putting up all these banners about Black Lives Matter and all this kind of stuff, the core of it is to get to this point of atonement. I think we are so far off that at the moment. I think mm. worldwide, not just here, we're so far off it, there's a lot of dishonesty because 
white people are just as traumatized. You know, in any psychological relationship, the abuser is as yeah. Is, is as damaged as the abuse, right? Yeah. Once so we get to that point where we're really honest about what this trauma is doing and how this is affecting both uh, communities on that energetic, spiritual level, that true traumatic level of, of understanding, that psychological understanding, then we can put up, you know, we can have Blackout Tuesday, we can have BLM, we can have whatever we do, we're still going to be stuck in a loop, you know? Mm-hmm. We're just going to quickly ask here, and how, practically taking on what John was saying about institutions, what, what have the Irish rep, how have they responded to the current um, craziness, madness, anger, how pouring? What, what, have, what have you guys been up to? We have a very progressive board, but it's not a very diverse board. There has been discussions about that. I know that our staff have been doing, you know, many of those, the webinars on diversity and really trying to, to, to push it forward. But we were taking a pass. And I don't think we need we should do that anymore. I think we need to we need to get into the business of it ourselves and mm. do more. We're trying to move the needle, you know, in whatever way we can, uh, and 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 open to all sorts of ideas about it. Because it must make it very difficult for your your position as um, sort of a keeper of Irish culture in terms of yeah. what make what we understand it as, and how you guys play the concept of what is happening. Here, here in America, it must be very difficult to find um, something that isn't performative or um, yeah. disingenuous. It must be really difficult because within the, the, the Irish canon, there are the terms of what we understand as black culture, or it's not, mm-hmm. it's not particularly big. There yeah. has to be narratives where there's intersectionality of race yeah. with cultures, right? Yeah. So every culture intersects with another, and there are stories there. There are these different narratives with the Irish and Black culture. There are stories yeah. there. You provided me this thing about Frederick Douglass. There's a story there, you know what I mean? Which allows you to tell the story of African Americans and Irish Americans. So I do think there are these different narratives within Irish American and Black American. So there's a place to start there and there's gotta be other intersectionalities with other races and other cultures. There just has to be. When I think about it, it's like, okay, we can start to work outside of our traditional bounds because we gotta move away from this performative nature of, okay, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. We have to really do something and we have to think outside we have to think outside of the box and say, listen, this is a big world. We're all dealing with each other. There has to be stories where we're intersecting with other races and other cultures. It just yeah. can't be just our culture. You know, it, it has to be, we have to get to this place of representing the diversity that we live amongst. Yeah. If we're going to be stubborn about that, we're just not going to get any further. We're just yeah. going to run right back into this circle and be even more angrier the next time. Yeah, the, the problem that I was saying with Kieran, I think, has is that if you are, if you have O'KC, if you have O'Neill, then you have you have a mandate for strictly Irish writers, most of whom are white Irish men. You can see whether you find new stories written from a, a perspective of other types of bodies, you know, black, male, female, whatever. You can see how that it, there's a there's a, there's something that's problematic there. Do you adapt? Do you change? What do you do if your mandate is strictly these this canon of white Irish male writers. This, this is the problem. Do you change the mandate? Does the Irish rep change its mandate slightly? Yes, you do. I think about, we, yeah. Yeah, do. we actually yeah. changed our core mission, but at one time it was to provide a platform for Irish and Irish American artists. Yes. We changed it to and other cultures for, specifically for, for this. And this wasn't just now that it happened. It happened before. We, when we send stuff out, we always, always put in there all, all ethnicities welcome. And we really want that to happen. We don't get a ton coming. I've grown to not, to no longer accept the argument of we can't find them. I know when I was doing a yeah. lot of Shakespeare, there were many other African Americans doing Shakespeare. Theaters weren't locating them and finding them. That all stems from not having diversity in those other roles. Yeah. Agents, casting directors, so they look only as far as their nose in their face and they don't look beyond. So this call for diversity is so important. It's not really trying to say, we're gonna hold your feet to the fire. We're just saying, we want a greater country. We want a greater yeah. life to live. Yeah, 100%. We want greater 100%. equality. So if we can get, I was talking to my manager the other day, I was like, 
I don't even know a black agent or a manager. Like, why is that? Not to say that I would immediately run to them, but like, why aren't they there? Why can't I walk into my agency and see black and brown faces well, we know that, why. Aren't, that aren't secretaries, you know, yeah, or, exactly. or, 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 or typing on a computer, but have, a, have an office. So exactly. when we talk about diversity and creating opportunity for all, particularly more black and brown bodies, it's only going to strengthen our situation because when, if I have to talk to a, a director or a casting director and say, you know, we can't find, we can't find more black and brown bodies. Well, I just think you're not trying hard enough. You got to try harder. You got to You you have to because if we stop there, then we'll never get anywhere. So it's like we just have to. We have to think outside of the box. We got to think of new ways to find these people. Let's go to the communities. Let's go to the churches. I don't care. That's what I was going to say. People. We have to find the people because what we've done in the past is we've broken our back to find these white individuals to be in the play. We've gone through all sorts of exercise to get those individuals, whether they come in in bulk or we have to go find something specific, we will do that. We have to just do that now, but we have to do it for those people who've been marginalized that haven't had those opportunities. I mean, this is this kind of a wave sweeping, hopefully the world, that it's like we have to start thinking about other people and not just ourselves so much yeah exactly if we want to live in a world that we can kind of say yeah this is what i wanted to be i'm happy there's equality there's diversity there's new ideas there's new things we're benefiting from each other's knowledge and life experiences we have to really take this step now that's what's important yeah. about it i so i hope as as obi says i hope that it's, this is not performative like and i've been trying to say that institutions need to make change within their context of the personnel that they work with, their board, yeah. their upper management, the communities they reach out to, the companies and businesses they reach out to demanding to see diversity, the same that they want to build into their institution. They want that with the other institutions that they work with. And I think if people can do that, if it's like, listen, I know we've been dealing with this restaurant that's doing our opening night parties, you know, this is an all white restaurant. Like, what, why can't we have do it at a black and brown restaurant or a restaurant that specializes yeah. in that sort of culture or that cultural food. I mean, let's do the um, the opening night meal for Emperor Jones at a West Indian restaurant. You know, I don't know, yeah. but like just, we yeah. have to start looking outside and looking reaching out greater representation yeah. and, and reach out. And that's going to be difficult. And it's going to be uncomfortable, you know, until we get to the swing of it. But I think yeah. that's what, that's what the streets are asking now. It's like, you know, how do we make this society more equitable for all, and particularly for black and brown bodies? How do we do that? And that's hard, but that's what we have to do. And if we're not willing to do that, we will run right back into this problem Same. again and again. Again, and again. The difficulty that so many of these institutions face is it's, it's a huge, it's a huge task, but the reaching out is so important because the performance of, you know, diverse casting and having, you know, the one token person that's on the board or one token person that's right. you know, at the desk or whatever, people, yeah. you know, it's no longer enough because no longer like, enough. It, will, it, it will perpetuate, but the difficulty can't be discounted. It's going to be very difficult to reach out into communities that may indeed think you're, you know, think you're the enemy, that may be very hostile, that may not trust you because of all of the, the past hurt and pain. And, and it's also something that's built into human beings. We, we, anything that's an other, we instantly take a step back. Yeah. So yeah. The, the difficulty yeah. can't be discounted, you know. But I, I, in terms of supporting you, Kieran, at the Irish Rep, if there's anything that I can do to get into those arenas, those uncomfortable arenas, I'm up for it. Because that's what's going to be needed. That's, this is what's going to be needed. If true change is to be yeah. embraced, well, you know, but, but let me just say, for all of the, for all of the talk about of, of the discomfort and for the, yeah. it's actually, it, it actually makes life a hell of a lot more interesting, to be honest. It does. You yeah. make some better plays, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'd love to go to a West Indian uh, restaurant for the opening night. I would love to go and, tr and, and see new things and hear new things, because God, you know, we, we just get into our own little box. Yeah, we do. our own people. We have our works cut out for us, but it can yeah. be so exciting. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Thanks so much, guys. This was a real, real wonderful, wonderful conversation. You're, you're Absolutely. both. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Obi. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you always for your wise words, your eloquence. Thank yeah. you so much. Right back at you.